Hello and welcome once again to the Monster Sci-Fi Show podcast, Sci-Fi from a Certain Point of View. I am your host, The Monster. I am back once more to give you not so much sci-fi news for this week, but I'm going to do two movie reviews. One on Jurassic Park, or sorry, Jurassic World, and Ant-Man. Now normally, my co-host Mr. Jane and I would be doing these podcast together but again due to our schedules i'm just doing this solo and it's going to be my third attempt to try to do this podcast a certain way that's going to be more manageable and feasible because the first attempt was more like a commentary of the actual movie the whole length of the movie so i'm like 20 minutes into the podcast i'm like i'm not even a quarter way through the show and i'm like this is not going to work. And then I tried again to do a shorter format and ran out of time. So I am now doing this the day before my birthday while I am at lunch at a different location uh, than I normally am uh, to do the podcast because there are a lot more kids or at least young ones in the library that it's even noticeable when I was in that room. So I had to move to a different location. Hopefully... I get to do this podcast properly, so we'll go forward from right now. So, if you haven't seen either one, Jurassic World or Ant-Man, there are going to be spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. So, you've been warned, and I'm sure, all like me, you guys have already seen this movie. For me, I just got to see this, uh, both of them, within um, about a couple of weeks ago, and like back-to-back, so... It was one of those, because of the canceled trip to Tampa that didn't happen, we got to do that instead, which was great. I'm not complaining, but it took a while to get to see this movie, so I'm glad that I did. So, let's start off with Jurassic World. Of course, the the director, Colin Trevorrow, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, this one film that he made prior to this was called um, Safety Not Guarantee, which starred... Aubrey Plaza, who I have a big crush on, um, and it's a small film that I actually wanted to see because it has a deal with time travel and seems to be kind of a little of a quirky film. Um, so Jurassic World is this big story uh, that he got to direct, and I think he did have a hand in writing the screenplay as well. He is not coming back for Jurassic World 2, or however they want to promote it, uh, but I think he will either be producing and writing or just writing or producing, so one or the other. Um, but for the most part, I was very happy with Jurassic World. If this is going to be a, quote-unquote, a summer movie, this was it. You didn't really have to think too much about what was not going to happen because you got exactly what was going to happen. You have dinosaurs, you have Rampage, you have big scares, you have lots of cool moments. And you got to be back in a world that we all loved many, many years ago. But, having said that, this is me now. If you know me, I start to analyze things after the fact. And and yes, little things bothered me throughout the way watching it the first time out. But, you know what? I, didn't really, I really didn't care. But, this is the podcast in which I'm going to start nitpicking stuff about. And just kind of like... Not bash it, but just kind of talk about certain things that worked for me, didn't work for me, and just go for there. All right. So, we get uh, Chris Pratt, who plays Owen. We get Bryce Dallas Howard, who plays Claire. And these are our two leads in this movie. My thing um, is, whose story is this really about? Um, Unlike Jurassic World... I mean, unlike Jurassic Park, in which, to me, I've always felt it's Dr. Alan Grant's story, in which he is, you know, a a a paleontologist that studies, does an archaeologist, um, in which he is brought to Jurassic Park to give his kind of stamp of approval of what has been created and so forth. So everything that he grew up with, all of his notions about what dinosaurs are and the notions with birds, you know, and then his um, 
other side of not being a parent came out during the, the part of the crisis where he had to take care of two children, which is Hammond's uh, grandchildren. So we saw kind of like a good character growth in him, and everyone else was fantastic. So to me, when I compared the two, Jurassic World, I am not sure as to what the point of this story is with these characters, other than they're in the story and they just kind of move things along. So as far as story arc or character development, there's none really. Um, Claire, the uh, Bryce's uh, character, doesn't have any connection to her nephews when they arrive to the to the island. And throughout the course of the story, she somehow... In the, to me, it was just... I didn't really feel emotionally connected because she did wind up taking care of them. But in no way, shape, or form did I feel that nurturing side of her come out in any way. Now, having said that, um, her character, in a nutshell, was that she was not going to be pretty much a damsel in distress, which I loved. And I'm tired of seeing that being portrayed in a lot of superhero movies uh, where the love interest is always in jeopardy and it's the hero who is always the male that has to rescue the you know the girlfriend so it gets really tiring so for claire for the most part you know she runs the damn park itself from day to day and you know she does get the help of owen but she has this really big massive um, climax scene in which she lures the T-Rex out with a flare which is a nice little nod to the original uh, Jurassic Park uh, movie and you know in which she gets that T-Rex to come and fight the Indominus Rex which is the uh, genetic hybrid dinosaur that they created of course they didn't know what was going to happen really <laughs> it was going to happen but one line she said um People are not excited about dinosaurs anymore. They see them as elephants, like everyday animals, which is kind of like what this movie is about, because we should be satisfied that it's just about dinosaurs. No, we need to see something bigger and better and more fierce. And that's exactly what the whole Indominus Rex really embodies, is this nastiness, this thing that's way out of our control, even more so. So... It's it's a good line, um, and I was kind of like hoping that there will be other components to that that kind of fill in the gap um, to make it more of a connection to me. The much uh, as much as I love watching Jurassic Park, it just really was just more action oriented. Think of it like in, in my mind as the first one being Alien, and the second one being Aliens. Second Aliens is more action oriented. Whereas, not that the first one wasn't, but it wasn't as elaborate. It wasn't as massive on this scale. Uh, because, one, we have a Jurassic Park world, so to speak, that has been functioning for the past, I think, 10 years, according to that storyline. And there were been no incidents until just when they got this Indominus Rex, um, you know, creature untamed, uncontrollable, and just unfortunately broke out of its cage, and this is what happens. So, um, the other line, uh, and has nothing to do with uh, Claire, but I guess um, Owen had some kind of tie in with uh, Vincent D- D'Onofrio, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, who plays Hoskins, and he is part of Engine's, I guess, detailed security guy. I don't know. It, it's still not clear to me but he talked about how he wanted to have a military application for the velociraptors and how extinct animals don't have rights I thought that's an interesting notion because how you know we would have uh, PETA the people for ethical treatment of animals how they would react having a park like this kind of like a zoo or disney doing animal kingdom and saying it's not a zoo um how would they react in that kind of environment to see that you know you have these creatures basically have no rights would they protest and 
we didn't get to see anything further with that, but I'm thinking in the sequel, because the one thing that it kept kind of hinting on is that we're going to see kind of an explosion of what's going to happen after the events of Jurassic World. Not so much in a way of there's going to be new zoos or things like that, but it's going to be other companies creating their own dinosaurs. So think of it as Apple, who redefined what a phone was uh, for a cell phone, and creating that iPod. And from there, you know, the market share was all of them. And then you get the competitors like Samsung that comes along and kind of makes their own version of their of their own iPod. And it goes from there. So you'll have other companies kind of throwing the dinosaurs out there beyond anything that we ever seen before. Again, to attract an audience, you have to make it bigger and better. And how many times we have to trade in our phones every year for something newer and shinier going to be the exact same way with the dinosaurs so we'll see what happens with the storyline with jurassic world at the second part in, in that sense the other thing um the the two kids um what was it zach and gray being that uh they were going off to visit uh claire on the island uh, away from their parents and seeing how they interact with each other was a very reminiscent of my own children. My son is very, very geeky into dinosaurs, facts galore, especially since he's been playing Lego Jurassic uh, World nonstop. And every day he's telling me new facts. And I was like, on and on and on. So it was just like, I get it. <laughs> it's him. Whereas the older brother is very much like my daughter. Uh, you know, he's not necessarily uh, want to be responsible for his younger brother, but eventually, in the course of the story, he does. But it, it was just a lot of little mannerisms that I saw because of the age similarity between the two uh, that I found at least a connection to the story. But again, after a while, I really didn't care because it is a focus on them. Is it on Claire? Is it on Owen? What's there is no real theme other than events. It's it's, it's action oriented, action driven, and characters are just going along with it. There's not much after that. Um, one thing I did want to bring up: Judy Greer, who plays their mother, also appears in Ant Man as a mother too. So it was weird to seeing her playing the similar character back to back on on that, and also. Uh, a note on Bryce Dallas Howard, her hair, which I, with her eyes really blew me away. But uh, eventually, Lily also had the exact same kind of haircut as well. So it was like similar in some fashion. So it was like, oh, this is a new style now. So I thought it was kind of funny just seeing, you know, the two movies back to back, how things were kind of similar. Um, but again, I was happy with it. I can't complain anything more about Jurassic World. Um, I do want to, again, do one uh, of a commentary to kind of expand um, watching the movie uh, with my friend, Mr. Jane, or other people who definitely want to do this with me when the movie does come out on DVD and Blu-ray, which I believe is sometime in October. All right, so I'm going to take a quick break. And I'm going to come back. Oh, 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 oh. I completely forgot. This is the one thing I've been, like, stressing about. The music. This is what I have to talk about. Okay. Everyone knows... Dun, 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 dun. I didn't do a good job on that at all. Whatever the case is, <laughs> is the, the theme. The original theme for Jurassic Park by John Williams is one of those scores that you feel the movie through the music. It lives and breathes without even the movie being there. So that's, to me, a mark of a great soundtrack. Okay. Problem lies is that because this movie is has high expectation, you know you're going to have to use the exact same theme, but you're going to have to make it different. Kind of like... Uh, I believe it's John Ottoman who had to do Superman Returns with uh, Brian Singer. 
So, you know, the movie that took place after episode two and between two and three. Um, so he had a delicate balance of kind of paying homage to the Superman theme, but still making it another Superman-like theme, and that's a struggle. This one also was having the same problem, and it's Michael... Oh, I'm blanking out on his last name. But he's done uh, a lot of work with J.J. Abrams, including Lost. He did the last two Star Trek movies. And here he has one theme that kind of works, but it doesn't have the exact same oomph. It doesn't have, it doesn't really capture anything more than it, it kind of borrows some notes from the theme, um, but it doesn't really make its own chords make it stand out make it so memorable that people remember that and start singing or humming that new theme it's impossible you can't do that um it doesn't come across and actually i'm going to play a little bit but just a little uh, segment i'm going to play between the breaks and you'll get the idea but you know uh, I was watching Peter Travers on Popcorn interviewing Bryce Dallas Howard about even between takes, the crew would watch the footage and start singing or humming the the Jurassic Park theme song. And that's how strong it is that you cannot top that. And I don't know how you could ever top that. But if you go in the way of what um, Zack Snyder did with the Man of Steel, you know, Hans Zimmer really made this a completely new soundtrack. His point for Zack was that we will make a Superman movie and that score will reflect as if that never existed. This is brand new, so ignore that. And I think that's what may have to happen because I'm not knocking how many times I hear that theme song being played or hummed by my son while he's watch, playing a, a Jurassic World. Um, but it needs to have its own theme that's going to be just as memorable and not so much playing homage. But if it's going to be a series, it needs to continue to be something more evolved. So make it bigger, better, and brassier, I guess. But whatever that is, I think that's definitely has to change so to kind of get away from Jurassic theme the Jurassic Park theme it needs to do something completely different so again give a quick listen to what I'm saying and then I'll be right back to talk about Ant-Man So now we are back for part two of the Monster Sci-Fi Show podcast movie re review. So this part I'm going to be talking about Marvel's latest addition to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Ant-Man, the movie that came out with Paul Rudd, Michael Douglas, and Evangeline Lilly. So again, this is going to be kind of like a lot of spoilers. So if you haven't seen it. Please just stop watching, or stop watching, stop re listening to my damn show. Not that anyone's listening to my show anyway, but I'm just saying, if you're listening to it and you haven't seen Ant-Man, then stop, for God's sakes. All right, um, so for the most part, it's a very enjoyable movie. I was def definitely really surprised about how much I liked this. Uh, I was a little bit worried about Paul Rudd not being... Not so much a superhero, but Paul Rudd playing Paul Rudd. He has a lot of uh, funny one-liners that he does a lot in movies. He has silly faces. He can be an ass. He can be all those guys. And he does that kind of similar to this character for Scott. And for the most part, 
it, it's fine. One thing I do give him credit for because when you see actors who portray heroes that have to wear a mask or a helmet or something that covers their faces, most of the time they don't want their faces to be covered. They will find a reason to have that taken off or whatever the case is. Think of it like how Steve, uh, uh, Sylvester Stallone in the first Judge Dredd movie. I can't say Judge Dredd. Uh, in that first movie, how he wore the helmet very little in that movie. Whereas Dredd, one with Carl Urban, which if you've not seen that, for God's sakes, please go check that out. It is so damn good. And he wears the helmet all through the day. He never takes it off. He never breaks that character. And I give him full credit on that. So I applaud actors that are so willing to be that character for the sake of that story without their egos being in the way. So with here, we get a good mixture of of Scott uh, Lang being both Ant-Man and himself, both in and out of the costume. So, And again, for the most part, I really enjoy this movie. There are going to be problems that I would have, which are going to be just minor little details about... <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> <coughs> the minor little details that I would have is just more of... We've seen the, kind of the origin story... Uh, being done again and again and again and again. And then, once again, get to reboot it again and again. So I get really tired of seeing that kind of storyline. So it's okay that the fact that, one, he- uh, Henry Pym is not Ant-Man. He didn't create Ultron, as in the comics. Scott Lang um, does take over, I think, in the comics, if I'm not mistaken, in the animated adventure series... The role of Ant-Man with the PIM technology he has to work with the ants to become Ant-Man. But my thing was Evangeline Lilly, her character, which is a daughter of Henry, and how she wasn't really given the chance to become, uh, in my mind, the hero of the story. She seemed more capable to me, and it would have made more sense to have her be the one in the Ant-Man suit, considering that, one, she works for the um, the corporate uh, office of where him... Uh, pa- Sorry. <laughs> it would have made more sense for her to be the Ant-Man to be in that costume because she had um, an inside track to the guy, uh, what's his name, Darren Cross, who was taking that PIM company into a public company, and he was going to go in a different direction. So if there was going to be a way to bring it down, uh, uh, Evangeline's character, Hope, would have been the perfect uh, person to do this. So it was, again, why did you need to bring Scott in? Yeah, you showed him as being a master criminal and so forth that he's able to get through uh, certain locks, certain situations, and whatever. Okay, that was fine. But to me, I'm just like, when are we going to see her be able to play a better character rather than a second fiddle? And I'm talking about like in The Hobbit. Um we even lost, you know, I got to be that point where it's like enough with, you know, being in a love triangle or being fought over and really not much more to her going forward. But if we had stayed for the very, very last post credit, which it was two, the very last one, we find out that uh, Dr. Uh, Pym had created a wasp outfit that belonged to uh, Hope's mother, which is Janet. And we do see the Wasp costume, and that 
was to me the finally a, a, a good moment that I was uh, really clapping at when she says the line, it's about damn time. And that's what I liked. That's what I wish had had more of that. And I'm, I'm not knocking Paul Rudd. I'm not knocking what they did. But for God's sakes, Marvel, please give us more female characters. Because I'm tired of it all being white guys. I'm tired of it being very dominated in this aspect. I want to see some diversity. So, finally we get Jen, hopefully in the second and in further movies, her character becoming Wasp in that. So, one of the things that I also uh, was worried about, in the trailer we see the, the one big joke in which... Uh, I guess this is towards the climax that Jello Jacket and Ant Man are fighting, and they're fighting on uh, Thomas the Tank Engine train set, and this is um, Scott's uh, daughter's train set. So as Yellow Jacket is about to get hit by Thomas, we cut to the reaction of the real world, or not a macro or micro version of that sh- same shot, but a macro version in which the train just kind of topples over and really easy, nothing big deal, but to him on a micro level, it was a big deal. Very funny, and kind of concerned, like, that's that might be the only laugh that you may get it out of the whole movie. Surprisingly, there were more laughs, and actually better laughs, that took me by surprise, and I was really happy about that. Because they could have played the whole little man in a suit jokes and and so forth. But there were some genuine laughs like when Yellow Jacket and and Scott as Ant-Man, they were fighting. And somehow (laughs) Scott got uh, like a paddle for for, uh, table tennis and smacked Yellow Jacket into a bug zapper. That was very funny because I never, I wasn't expecting that, but the laughs kind of got better even after that. So that was the one thing that I was really surprised at because a lot of the payoff finally comes towards the third act when you have the big climax. But for the most part, one of the big surprises to me um, that I liked uh, was uh, Michael Pena, who played Lewis. He had two very funny scenes in which he's retelling to Alan how certain things came to be, but he's using his voice and doing flashbacks or using his voice and other characters telling how he got that certain piece of information over and over again. And, of course, we get Stan Lee in one of those um, uh, those uh, cameos that we always expect him to be, and it was just hysterical. I loved it. So I give him kudos because he actually, to me, stole the movie twice in that aspect. Not so much uh, Scott Lang. Although, let me back it up. Um, I was pleasant, even su- surprised that they were going to throw in um, Anthony Mackie, who played Falcon in the uh, Captain uh, America with the Soldier movie, that he makes an appearance and fights uh, Anne Bed on this. I'm like, oh my god, this is actually be turning into a good movie now. Because, you know, you're incorporating different things part of that universe. And I'm like, that's really fantastic. But, even better, to me, I think the opening shot in which we get a very young Michael Douglas. Of course, it's all computer enhanced. But, we see the beginning of the Triskelion for the headquarters for S.H.I.E.L.D. And there's Agent Carter, right in the fold. And I was kind of happy to see that. So... It kind of made my day, considering, you know, how she made my uh, summer, so to speak, after Comic-Con with her Dub Smash um, Twitter feed constantly against the uh, people from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So I enjoyed her, and seeing her on the screen again made me feel happy. So for all its problems uh, since the departure of Edgar Wright, yeah, it, it tied in quite nicely into the... MCU, um, at the the first post te- uh, post credit uh, teaser, I guess, um, scene had the I guess Bucky 
his arm hold, being held up by something, or he, he was on the ground and his arm was up. But um, Anthony Mackie had found where Bucky was hiding out, and then there's um, Chris Evans as Captain America coming in uh, to talk about what they're going to do, and basically he's telling uh, Anthony, you know what, let's not tell Tony anything. I don't want him involved with this, which leads into next year's uh, Captain America Civil War. So basically from the Avengers and what had happened in the last Age of Ultron movie, it makes sense that he doesn't want anything to do with Tony or Tony to have anything to do with Bucky. So it makes sense. And that's that. So again, a good movie, enjoyable, fun, nothing really wrong with it. It's a good popcorn movie. Can't wait to see it again um, on DVD and Blu-ray. And hopefully I get to do a commentary on that again. And definitely it's going to be much longer than this podcast. And hopefully you'll enjoy what I have to say in, in, in general. So, all right. So, um, that's about it. I'm recording this the 14th of August, which is a day before my birthday. And if you're listening to this when it's released, so it will be... On my birthday, I'll be 48 years old. Two years away from AARP, and I can't wait to get my jitterbug phone with the big numbers. Yay. And the uh, senior discounts everywhere. (laughs) All right. And less than two weeks, uh, I've been tweeting about my interview that I'm going to be doing on my page 49 podcast, which is again the library podcast I'm going to be working on, hopefully spin off to do more episodes with young adults um, author (laughs) Amy S. King and that's going to be on August 25th so if you have any questions or you have any comments you want me to relate to her, please you can email me or direct message me on Twitter with the Siffy handle, so that's Monster Sci Fi Show with the S Y F Y Show on Twitter. You can find me on Facebook at the Monster Sci Fi Show page, as well as email me. You can do that at the Monster Sci Fi Show at gmail.com. So I'm glad I finally got through this the third time to do this podcast. So uh, that's about it. So, thank you very much for listening to the Monster Sci-Fi Show podcast. Sci-Fi, from a certain point of view. Good night, folks. <laughs>